When a baby girl is born, she already yeah. has all of the follicles that go on to become the eggs that go on to become her potential children. And so we, like half of Mark, half of Ellen, existed in the ovary of our mom as a fetus in the womb of our maternal grandmother. Huh. So our DNA has been in a dynamic with this environment for two generations. Well, and we're and we're seeing, and I can't reference studies because I'm not scientific that way. But we're, but I believe people have written in books that I've read <laughs> that the things that happen even generations past. The reason that that perhaps alcoholism can be something that, or addictive nature could be something that's hereditary. It's like stuff that was happening maybe 60, 70, 80 years ago might be impacting people today. And the decisions we're making today could be impacting generations to come. Exactly. And it's one thing to say, oh, we know that this baby was born after there was a great famine and therefore their metabolism is such that they're more likely to hoard calories and fat. But it's another thing still to say, well, generational trauma and perhaps epigenetics are our material basis for how we are passing on trauma that our ancestors have gone through. All of this is to say, we're plastic. We're in a dynamic with the environment and we've been impacted by the past and we should honor that and tell that story. But we also can impact ourselves today and we can impact our future offspring and even our grandchildren and future generations. And I think that we just need to recognize how plastic these things are. And mental health, we've been handed down this story that it's your genetic chemical imbalance and you're stuck. It's you, it's your destiny. And we don't need that story. That is not a helpful narrative. There's certain times when it's helpful to be like, ah, giving it a name helps me, it grounds me. Um, knowing that there's a pill that helps this helps me, it grounds me. That's all well and good, but there's too many people stuck in the shadow of this. It's not actually helpful for them. So that's where we need to expand our definition and recognize our mental health is impacted by our sleep, by our nutritional status, micronutrient status, inflammation levels, the health of our digestive tract, our hormone balance, and then all of those psychospiritual factors. And just to kind of bang out a couple of those quick wins, let's perhaps start with sleep. And sleep. <laughs> you is... mean you mean focus on sleep? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I think that like sleep is certainly our best medicine. When we're talking about mental health, people are always like, well, I don't sleep well. And it's because of the depression, because of the anxiety. You say, like, I, I have insomnia because of my anxiety. And that's valid, but it's a two-way street of communication. And basically our anxiety, our depression definitely does impact our sleep but our sleep impacts every single mental health diagnosis under the sun, and it's the easier entry point. So let's fix sleep, because you can sleep that in a matter of weeks, and that's easier than seven years of psychotherapy on the couch to fix the depression. If you wanna know more about how you can quiet that restless mind to get more things done, overcoming depression or anxiety or insomnia or ADHD, click on the link right over there to hear the full conversation I have with the one and only Dr. Ellen Vora.